In this episode, we'll introduce the dots conversion workflow. This simplifies the entity creation process. We'll attach a small utility to convert a game object into an entity at runtime. Then we can use that as a prefab to generate a whole lot more entities. In the last episode, we created this simple entity cube. Check out the link in the description to the GitHub project, or else just start with a clean project in Unity 2019.3 or above. You need to have the entities and hybrid renderer packages imported from the package manager. And you'll need to provide your own mesh and material and create a spawner object and replicate a very simple spawner script. Anyway, here's what's been done. We have a cube created as an entity, position the main camera to get a good look at it, game object, align with view. Nothing shows up in the hierarchy at runtime. We can only see it in the entity debugger. The entity is here and its component types are over here, but it took this entire script to make a simple cube. So instead, try this. Drag the smooth cube model into the hierarchy unpack it completely so it's a regular game object, and move it next to the entity that we've already created. So let's try coordinate, say, 404 or something like that. I will rename the object to converted cube. If I press play right now, we have an entity sitting side by side with a game object. While that is OK, our goal is to work in ECS, so we want to convert this game object into an entity. And we'll do that with a simple script that you can find under dots, convert to entity. The conversion mode should default to convert and destroy. If you go to play mode, you'll see that the game object disappears from the hierarchy. And now we have an extra entity in the entity debugger. Entity one is the game clock. Entity two is what we're generating from the spawner script. And converted cube is actually entity zero. And that's the result of the convert to entity. You'll notice that the archetype for the converted cube is nearly the same as entity2, except there's an extra per instance culling tag data type. We'll explain tags in a later episode, but effectively, this is just a simpler way of creating entities. For example, if you were building an environment, you could drop in a bunch of game objects into the hierarchy just like you normally would. Just add the convert to entity to each object, and there you go. Your game objects become entities at runtime. Exit play mode, and then they return to game objects once again. You can use the usual interface tools to rotate, position, and scale, and that's what we call a win-win. You have the interactivity of game objects in the editor, but the performance of entities at runtime. The other option you have is to use both. If you switch the conversion mode to convert and inject game object, then in play mode, you get both an entity in the entity debugger and a game object in the hierarchy. This is useful in some cases, especially while Dots is still early in development and a lot of features don't exist quite yet in Dots. You may need a game object to work with part of your application and an entity with the other. But in our case, we'll switch this back to Convert and Destroy. The Convert to Entity works great for any objects you can set up ahead of time. You'll need some mechanism to convert entities at runtime using this conversion workflow as well. For example, you may need to shoot bullets from a weapon or spawn enemies in the middle of gameplay. We will still need to do a little bit of scripting to create entities on the fly, and what we can do is designate an entity that functions as a prefab. Let's save this converted cube as a classic game object prefab first, and I'll be civilized and keep that in a prefabs subfolder. Go ahead and delete the cube from the hierarchy. And let's revisit the spawner mono behavior script. So here's our spawner from the last episode. I do, however, basically want to start fresh. We can save what we did last time just as a reference, but otherwise we won't use it again. So let's fold the make entity method out of the way. I'll just tuck that at the bottom and clear out start. Make sure you keep all of the same using lines at the top, using entities definitely. And very likely, you'll need these at some point too. Maybe not Unity rendering, but we'll need Unity transforms and Unity mathematics. So I'll just leave them all for now. Let's define a few fields. Expose a variable for the game object prefab. Serialize field, private game object, game object prefab, 
This represents the game object prefab. I'll need to convert this into an entity prefab. So I also want to reserve a private entity entity prefab variable. To make everything a little bit cleaner, let's set up some private variables for the world and entity manager. Private world, default world, private entity manager, entity manager, and mostly this is just for legibility so the lines don't get too long in the script. In start, let's do some setup. Get the reference to our world and entity manager. Default world equals world dot default game object injection world and entity manager equals default world entity manager. Convert to entity is actually working in stages. The hierarchy that holds our game objects and model behaviors is what we'll refer to as the classic world. Anything with a convert to entity gets sent to an intermediate conversion world. Unity looks at each game object, sees what data is compatible, and then tries to pipe that data into a corresponding entity. After another conversion process, the entity emerges in the destination world. And that's what you see in the entity debugger. Unity ports the data from game object to entity. This conversion process will be more transparent in future versions of Unity. Just be aware that it is indeed happening, even if it may seem like a black box at times. We'll revisit this later when we discuss custom component types. For now, we just need to define some settings for the most basic conversion. We only want to convert a simple game object transform and represent it on an entity. To start, we'll make a conversion object called settings. Game object conversion settings, settings equals game object conversion settings from world, passing in default world, and no, sorry, that's a mouthful. Now you could use the var keyword here to make it a little bit shorter, but since we're learning this, I don't want to hide any data types. Basically, this returns some settings using the from world method. You pass in a reference to the default world as the first argument, and then the second argument represents what's called the blob asset store. It's not important in this case, and we don't need it, so we pass in null. And now we have an object that contains some conversion settings. You'll use those to create our entity prefab, which we'll do right now. Entity prefab equals game object conversion utility dot convert game object hierarchy, passing in the game object prefab and the settings that we just created. Again, I realize this is a lot of new syntax, but essentially this game object conversion utility is just something that converts game objects into entities. It has a static method convert game object hierarchy, so it will convert a game object and all of its children. We pass in the game object prefab as the first argument and the settings as the second argument. You could stuff this whole settings line inside of here. I broke that out just for readability. Now, while this may seem quite complicated, really we're just running a conversion utility and storing it as an entity in our entity prefab variable. The resulting entity prefab can be reused. Just like we can instantiate game object prefabs, we can instantiate entity prefabs. And let's break that logic into a separate method called instantiate entity. When we instantiate an entity prefab, we'll need to give it a position. So let's pass in a float3 position to instantiate the entity and save it as a local variable. I'll just write entity my entity equals entity manager dot instantiate passing in the entity prefab. And basically that's it. Assuming our game object prefab converted correctly, then this should instantiate an entity. Of course, it comes in untransformed at 000. You'll need to add one line to position it somewhere else in space. We always manipulate our entities using the entity manager. So I just need to invoke entity manager dot set component data. We pass in the entity as the first argument and then the data itself as the second. So this will become new translation and inside of the curly braces, value equals position. Again, just check out the syntax from the old make entity method to compare. It's very similar, except we used add component data previously because we didn't have the convert to entity already adding the data for us. Scroll back to the start method and let's instantiate our prefab at say 404. I'll invoke instantiate entity and then pass in a float three, four, zero, four, and they should be floats. And now that should do something. So save the script, 
back in Unity, select our spawner object, drag the converted cube prefab into the game object prefab field, and our conversion script should do the rest. In play mode, an entity now shows up at 404, and it's not a game object. There's nothing in the hierarchy. But if you check out the entity debugger, we now have three entities. Entity 0 is the clock. Entity 1 and Entity 2 look very similar, but Entity 1 has an extra prefab component. And you can sort of see that in the inspector, especially when I toggle between them. Entity 1 is the prefab, and Entity 2 is the instance. They're both entities, so that's why you see them both show up here. But essentially, this is how you instantiate entities using this conversion workflow. There's still some scripting, but it's a little bit less syntax than going pure ECS. Of course, Dots really shines when you're working with a lot of entities, and that's really where a lot of the efficiency comes in. So let's clone a bunch more entities on our scene from our entity prefab. Back in the spawner script, make another method called instantiate entity grid. I'll generate a whole bunch of entities in a grid-like pattern. Instantiate entity grid, and I'll pass in some integer arguments defining the dimensions of the grid and a float for the spacing. int dimension x, int dimension y, and float spacing. I'll default that to 1. Let's loop a couple of times, once in the x dimension. Count i up to dimension x. And then we'll add another loop inside of that. So we'll count j up to dimension y. And then inside of the second loop, we'll invoke instantiate entity. Let's position our entity at x equals the first index, y equals the second index, and just 0 for the z. So instantiate entity, i, j, 0. Multiply the x and the y by the spacing, i times spacing, j times spacing. And then all this belongs inside of a float 3, and that's why it's still highlighted in red. So we'll make a new float 3 out of these three numbers. And then in start, we'll invoke instantiate entity grid instead of just making one entity. So we'll replace this line with instantiate entity grid. And let's just try a 10 by 10 grid with a spacing of 1. 10, 10, 1. When you go back to Unity and press play, and look at that. We now have 100 entities suddenly created. Tumble the scene camera around so you can get a good look at the grid of cubes. My entity is a unit cube, and we're using a spacing of 1. So our 10 by 10 grid is packed together, just as you would expect. And there you go, 100 cubes created just like that. No game objects needed except for the one prefab to start us off. In the entity debugger, you'll see that we have 102 entities in total, one game clock, one entity that serves as a prefab, and 100 instances of that prefab stacked in a 10 by 10 grid. To be a little more flexible, instead of hard coding in the 10 by 10, we can define a few extra fields in the spawner script. So we can add an int x size, an int y size, and I can still default those to 10. Let's add a float for the spacing, and I'll start with a value of 1. And let's add a range attribute to make this a little bit easier. I'll try a range between 0 0.1 and 2, and that'll make it a slider. And we'll pass these into the instantiate entity grid. Instantiate entity grid, x size, y size, and spacing. OK, terrific. Let's save this and go back to Unity. And now we can experiment with the dimensions of the grid in the inspector. So let me try, say, a 30 by 10 grid with a spacing of 2. In play mode, it sort of looks like that. We have one unit of space in between each cube. Maybe that may be a little bit much, but maybe that is what you want for your application. Now, since we're making a rather large field of cubes, let me adjust my camera some more. Again, I'll exit play mode, align with view. In the spawner, let's try 30 by 20 with a spacing of 1.1. Let's see what that looks like. You get this nice uniform grid of cubes with a small margin in between them. And that's how you can use the conversion workflow to generate 
one entity or a whole lot of them. If you want to compare the two different script methods, you can see that the conversion workflow does save you a bit of coding. And while it's still good to know the pure ECS, it's nice to do part of the setup in the editor. And then we can drop a lot of things that we had to write manually. OK, great. We have covered the E of the ECS. We can make entities. Now we need to do something with them. In the next episode, let's take a look at components and systems and see how we can make our cubes move. All right, well, thanks for watching. Remember to check the website for news and updates. There's a link in the description. Of course, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss anything new. Tap the bell to get notifications. Until the next video, I'll see you in the Game Academy.